Um, those that are um, connected remotely, please turn off your microphone. <laughs> world scientists and thinkers. He has written more than 400 in our articles and 62 chapters. And if you go into PubMed and you look at publication by year, um, most individuals um, usually have a peak, um, much earlier on in their career. And now you can see the number of publications written down. Uh, he continues to climb up, climb up and climb up. And these are all England <laughs> Journal Lancet uh, and many uh, like. Um, I will tell you that um, I um, think that it's uh, much harder to follow someone like Eric Topol um, at an institution when it's ranked at the top and to keep it at the top than uh, taking on an institution that is lower ranked and bringing it up. So Steve kept the Cleveland Academy as number one for his entire tenure. That is a remarkable accomplishment, knowing how many great institutions are in the US. Um, you probably know a lot about the publication of Steve in the area of statins and uh, other drugs uh, to improve cardiovascular uh, alcohol hematoresclerosis. That's probably the, the, the most important or well known aspect of this contribution. But I am aware of one that probably many of you uh, haven't heard of. When I was a junior attending there, there were a bunch of patients dying in the CCU with uh, severe aortic stenosis, very low ejection fraction, intractable heart failure. There was a first year fellow, Umesh Koch and Steve, who came up one day and said, you know, these people, they probably need a vasodilator. So everyone else, got up in arm and say, well, you're gonna kill them. 
that's what keeps their blood pressure up. So they give nitrite to a large consecutive series of these patients. Ejection fraction improved, hemodynamics improved, they became surgical candidates. It's a New England Journal of Paper uh, published in the 1990s. Uh, and uh, I encourage you to read because it really demonstrated courage and uh, the ability to think completely against the, the, the norm. So, uh, Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. Him and I have not completely agreed on everything. At that point. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times um, about uh, the relative utility of a new technology, CT coronary angiography. Well, I guess I was very excited in 2006 about it. And Steve was very negative about it. And at the end of the day, when I read it over and over, I think either you or I were completely wrong. <laughs> it's not the technology, it's a social media. You know the social media that kills you is how we use it. And uh, CT coronary angiography can be used uh, in a positive way or not. Thank you again for coming today. Thank you, Mario. Well, it is uh, really a pleasure to be here. And, uh, you know, we go back a lot. I have a number of friends here in the audience, Aldo and I go back a, a ways and so on. So thank you all for coming. Um, I want to talk with you about obesity and cardiovascular disease. I think this is the, this is the disease of the century. And I think we need to own this because obesity, how does obesity kill? It kills the cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. It's all linked together. So, the prevalence is increasing at an alarming rate. What you see here is that by the year 2030, we are gonna have 1 billion people on this planet with obesity. And if you look at the trajectory, it is not slowing, it is continuing, and it's been going on now for a couple of decades. It's an enormous problem. I once uh, measured the, uh, the BMI of everybody in the CCU one day, 24 patients. It was like 34. I mean, that's who's filling up our coronary arteries. Now, um, these are by country, it's by country. We are leading the way in the USA, uh, as you can see, but Mexico, UK, Australia, even countries like Japan that used to have almost no obesity are now beginning to see obesity. See obese people on the streets in Tokyo and Osaka. So this is a global problem. It's not just a US problem. Uh, here's some, uh, some data from the United Kingdom. These are projections. And you can see that we're talking about nearly half the population by 2034 at the current rate, 46% in the UK will be obese. But look at youth obesity, look at children with obesity. That's also increasing. And if you wanna see this, just go to any uh, McDonald's and look who's standing in line buying the supersized fries and, and soda. It's obese teenagers. Even countries that never had a lot of obesity, like Spain. Look at the rates of increase in Spain and in children uh, in, in Spain. So these rates are really increasing at an alarming rate. So several years ago, I worked with uh, a journalist at the Wall Street Journal. We did this uh, article, worked together on it, uh, that really demonstrated the progress and the treacherous situation we're in. If you go back to the mid-1950s, the death rate for cardiovascular disease was just catastrophic. People were having MIs in their 40s. Uh, you know, uh, we had a president, Dwight Eisenhauer, had a myocardial infarction while, in, while, while president while visiting Colorado. And then look at what we've accomplished. Look at the rates of decrease in cardiovascular disease uh, over the last, you know, four, five, six decades. But look over here. What you see is beginning a few years ago, that rate starts to increase. And uh, it is our conclusion that it is the obesity epidemic that has reversed and beginning to reverse decades of progress in reducing cardiovascular morbidity mortality. 
Um, this data is a little bit old, but it's still very relevant. This is from Celine Musis. This is the, the inner heart study. And what you can see here is that like smoking and diabetes and hypertension, obesity is an important risk factor, but it is also an amplifier. If you smoke, have diabetes and have high blood pressure and you're obese, your risk of a myocardial infarction is 21 fold higher. I mean, you don't see hazard ratios like that very often. And so when you have these other comorbidities and you're obese and they, and they often go together, uh, you're at enormous risk. So uh, one of the questions, of course, is what about all-cause mortality? And it turns out, and this has been debated for many years, but what you have to look out is uh, you have to look out at over time. This is from uh, uh, a study uh, done by uh, folks in the UK, published in JAMA Cardiology. And what you see is that uh, there is a gradation from being underweight to obese. And you have to look out about 20 years to really see the effect. And so you see somebody who's, you know, 35 years old and obese, they're not gonna die of obesity related diseases until they're 55. And so this is something that if we can interrupt it, there, there is an enormous potential for having a downstream effect, but it's gonna take a long time to see those differences. So what is the impact on life expectancy? Uh, at age 40, if you look at the reference group with a normal uh, BMI of 18 and a half to 25, and then you go out and you look at people who are morbidly obese. For men, they lose almost a decade of life expectancy. And for women, <clears throat> about eight years. So these are really big differences. These are really huge. Uh, obesity affects a multitude of cardiovascular diseases. And so uh, for those of you in the heart failure community, obesity has a very strong link to risk of heart failure. A lot of it is hep pep, but it also is hep ref. And you can see, again, this steep gradation from normal weight to severe obesity and incidence rate for heart failure, but also coronary disease and stroke. So it's not just a single, it's not just, not just myocardial infarctions, but it is all a spectrum of cardiovascular diseases that are affected. So this is just, I want to show you data from women. This is from, the, from Framingham. And we've known this for decades. This is the, the uh, incidence of CHF by weight classification and normal weight versus overweight. That's just a BMI of 27. To obese, a BMI of 30 and greater. And you can see that over time and not, not that long a time, there is a increased risk of heart failure. Uh, for the electrophysiologists in the, in the group, obesity is strongly linked to risk of atrial fibrillation. And you can see amongst men and amongst women, over time, uh, the risk of atrial fibrillation goes up. And as people age, it, it's gonna go up naturally, but it goes up a lot more if you're obese. Now, what's really striking is the increases we're seeing now in childhood and adolescent obesity. What I want you to see is that shown in orange here, if you're obese in childhood, but not as an adult, the risk is not terribly great. But if you're obese in childhood and as an adult, rates of type two diabetes, bipolar greater, hypertension, having a low HDL, having hypertrichosideremia, they're all driven by this. And so what does it tell us? It tells us that the best time to intervene on obesity is in adolescence. And we are not getting it done. Uh, the rates of uh, obesity in adolescence, as I've said, are increasing dramatically. So this is 1.9 million adolescents, and this is the risk of stroke. And I suspect some of you have seen this, young people coming in with stroke. And, you know, we look for all kinds of other causes, you know, PFOs and everything else. But it turns out 
that in fact, there is a strong link between body weight and obesity and the risk of stroke in young adulthood. These are people in their 30s and 40s who are having strokes very, very strongly linked to obesity. Now, a, a debate that has gone on for many years is does fitness reduce or eliminate adverse cardiovascular outcomes associated with obesity? You hear this all the time. I'm all overweight, but I'm really fit. I go to the gym, I work out, you know, I can, you know, I, I, some of these folks even run. And so there's this myth that maybe baby fitness can, can overcome fatness. Well, it does to a little extent. But what I want you to see is amongst fit men who are obese, there's about a 39% risk of increased risk of CBD. If they're unfit, it's greater. No question about it. Same with women. But you can see that in the left-hand bars, being fit does not eliminate the risk of obesity. So fitness does not overcome the risk of obesity. And you hear this from patients and you have to tell them the truth, which is, which is that it's not healthy even if you're fit. Now, uh, in Sweden, everybody has to serve in the military and they test them for cardiovascular fitness and they, of course, measure body mass index. And what you can see is that both have a huge impact. If you're in the worst decile for fitness versus the best decile, there is just an enormously big difference in the risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, but the same thing is true for body mass index. And so, you know, they, these are people entering the, entering the Swedish military who have class three obesity. And, you know, they, they, uh, they tend to do well, well in basic training, I can tell you that. But but you can see that both, both fitness and fatness have a big impact on outcome. And this is yet one more study. And again, what you see here is that there is, a, there is an improvement in physically fit, but you still have this 1.6 fold increase hazard ratio for cardiovascular disease. If you're not fit, the risk is enormously increased. Um, what about metabolic status? Again, we see this sometimes, not, not necessarily that often, but somebody comes in, they're obese, their HDL is normal, their triglycerides are normal, their HbA1c is normal. They don't have any of the, the comorbidities associated with obesity. And it turns out that if you're metabolically unhealthy, if you have those, those features, uh, obviously risk is very very high. If you're metabolically healthy, but obese, you also have an increased risk. So we can't explain all of the cardiovascular morbidity and mortality on the basis of these comorbidities of low HDL and high triglycerides and so on, hypertension. It doesn't explain all of it. So here's the question. Not a simple one. How does obesity cause cardiovascular disease? I've already shown you that it's not entirely explained by the comorbidities. And so those of us that have been working in this area believe that the key to all of this is ectopic fat uh, deposition. You get fat in the perivascular tissue, you get it in the myocardium and pericardium, you get it in muscle leading to insulin resistance, you get fatty liver, I'm going to talk about that a little later. You get it in the renal sinus, which tends to lead to renal disease, and you get visceral adiposity, and which produces cytokines that lead to increased inflammation, increased C-reactive protein. So it is all this ectopic fat that's causing the trouble. Now, I, I did grant rounds not too long ago at Johns Hopkins, where they have a huge database of people that they, they still biopsy a lot of people that come in with heart failure. And what they see in obese people with heart failure is they see myocardial steatosis. So there's, there's fat in the heart muscle. And I think that's the reason that they get half-deaf and half-round is it's the, the fat 
is distributed everywhere. And so there is this, this Venn diagram here. You have obesity, abdominal obesity is worse. You have the coarse elevated CD risk and you have elevated CRP. And the mechanism here is now very well understood. Fat cells are not inert. Fat cells produce cytokines and those cytokines travel to the liver and they stimulate C-reactive protein. If you look at studies that are done like Jupiter, a long time ago, those people were actually mostly obese. The people that have high CRP, it's, they're linked very closely together. Um, we've known for a long time, and I know most of you are well aware of this, that it is really body habitus has a big, big difference. That if you have abdominal obesity, you tend to have much greater risk of cardiovascular disease. A simple uh, paper tape measure ought to be in every clinic, every cardiovascular clinic. It's in our clinic. And we have our nurses measure waist to hip ratio and everybody that comes in. You will see some people, we call this the gynecoid pattern of obesity because it's more common in women, where all the weight is in the hips, buttocks, thighs. It's, it's all down here, pear shape. And they tend to be metabolically healthier. And then you see men that have just a little tummy bulge and their waist to hip ratio is increased and they're metabolically very unhealthy and it is very closely linked. And as I'm going to show you, it is ethnically distributed. So here's, here's the relationship. This is why BMI alone isn't enough information. Look at somebody with a BMI here of about 30. They can have a waist circumference of 85 centimeters or 110 centimeters. That is a really big difference. And in fact, you can go down here and have a BMI of 25 and have a waist circumference of nearly 100. That is not healthy. Those are folks that are very much more likely to develop cardiovascular disease. And uh, here's, the, here's the data. This is the CV hazard. Lowest tertile of BMI, but a high waist circumference. Look at the hazard ratio on the far left. In the middle, a waist or a BMI, it's in kind of the mid range, not really even you know, the obese range, same thing in the highest tertile. But down here with a BMI of less than 24 and a half, if you have a high waist circumference, you are at risk. And we see this all the time. I take care of a lot of patients that are of South Asian uh, uh, ancestry, uh, you know, immigrants from, from India and uh, related countries. And here's what, what you see. A BMI of 30 in white Europeans is equivalent to a BMI of 22.6 in South Asians. And I can't tell how many of these patients I've seen. They come in and their BMI is normal. It's not elevated. Uh, you know, they're of, of South Asian origin and they have this tummy bulge and their HDL is 28 and their triglycerides are 250 and they're hypertensive and they may already have diabetes and they're not very old. And so you have to understand that waist circumference, particularly depending on your ethnic origins, can be a very important predictor of risk. And you have to address it. You have to talk to people about this because it is an important comorbidity. So I talked about the relationship of BMI to CRP. So using a cut point of 2.2, what you see here is that once the BMI gets above 30, particularly in women, more than half of women with a BMI greater than 30 have a high CRP and nearly half of men. And so this is clearly an important uh, comorbidity is inflammatory risk. I don't know if you saw the manuscript that uh, Paul Richter and I uh, wrote in the Lancet uh, last year, but you know, we, we, we studied this very carefully and we showed that this residual inflammatory risk, regardless of your LDL cholesterol, is a major driver of cardiovascular risk. 
hypertroglyceridemia comes with the territory. And again, uh, a little worse in women than in men, BMI of 30, your odds ratio for having high triglycerides goes up over fivefold. Uh, with men, it's fourfold. And so, again, something we see, high triglycerides. How do we treat high triglycerides? We don't give people drugs. You don't lose weight. You know, the drugs don't work. Um, uh, but, but weight loss does. And I'll show you a little bit of data. I think I included that slide here. Now, Elliot Jocelyn, who founded the Jocelyn Clinic, is a very smart guy. And this is what he said in 1927. He said, with an excess of fat, diabetes begins. And from an excess of fat, diabetics die. Really impressive comment. Almost 100 years ago. And of course, you all know this relationship. How steep the relationship is between BMI and incident diabetes. Uh, it is uncommon to see people at my age who are obese who don't have diabetes. Um, it just takes a little bit of time, but they're insulin resistant. At some point, their pancreas loses the ability to keep up with their insulin resistance. And the next thing you know, they have diabetes. And it's, however, as I will show you, reversible. So the question is, what? What can weight loss do for these people? Well, I'll show you a little bit of data. There's lots more. If you, if you lose weight, your triglycerides plummet. And you can see that the change in triglycerides in milligrams per deciliter, if you can lose 15% of body weight, we're talking about 70 milligrams per deciliter reduction in triglycerides. Very, very steep effect. Even a little bit of weight loss makes some difference, as you can see here. And the question is, can substantial weight loss favorably affect diabetes? So this was kind of fun for me. So one of our bariatric surgeons approached me a number of years ago. He said he wanted to do a randomized controlled trial. He'd never done a randomized controlled trial before. He's a surgeon. Um, and uh, he said, I want to study the effect of bariatric surgery on people who have diabetes on the reversibility of diabetes. And so we designed the study together and I helped him run it. It was, this is the three-year outcomes. The only study I ever did that I published three times in the New England Journal. We published the one-year, the three-year, and the five-year results. The New England Journal took all three papers uh, because they thought it was important. It's only 150 patients. And for the young people here, just keep in mind you don't have to study a large group of people to, to, to have insight. That study of nitric oxide was 25 people done by one of our fellows, okay? So uh, this was 150 patients. I'll show you the design in a minute. And here's what we did. We had an endocrinologist who's very good manage uh, a third of the patients, 50, with intensive medical care. I mean, saw these patients frequently, gave them the best treatment for diabetes, tried to get them to lose weight, ruin Y bypass in 50 and sleep gastrectomy in 50. And then we followed them out for five years. Uh, we published initially the primary endpoint was at 12 months. The question is what would happen? And here's what happened to their hemoglobin1c. It went down almost 3%. 3% means if you start out at, at eight and a half, you end up at five and it was remarkable. We got some initial benefit from medical therapy, but by the end of 36 months, it was pretty small, the benefit with medical therapy. This is the number of diabetes medications. And what you see is with the gastric bypass patients, they were on 0.5 beds, meaning that they were typically on, you know, a gram metformin a day. And they had normal hemoglobin1c. Most of them, the diabetes disappeared. We did bariatric surgery. We showed in this small study. When the journal understood the importance and they published it, that you can reverse diabetes with weight loss. Now it takes a fair amount of weight loss, but you can absolutely. These people, a lot of them, over half of them, were on insulin, and they came off insulin. 
it's a remarkable finding. And it's important to recognize this when you see these patients, what can be accomplished if you can get them to lose weight. Well, what about diet or conventional drug therapy? I mean, you know, we can't do bariatric surgery in a, bil in a billion people with obesity. You know, we can do it in a few hundred thousand in, the, in a rich country like the United States, but it isn't a global solution to the problem. And it has its own downsides, as I think I'll, as I'll show you in a minute. So this was the look ahead trial. Now, the NIH invested more money in this trial than any trial that they have ever done. It was $100 million. $100 million of taxpayer money, 10-year trial. And what they did was they saw these people frequently. They had coaches, they had dietitians, they had physiologists. They gave them the most intensive lifestyle alteration for weight loss you can imagine. And they got a net effect of a four kilogram weight loss over, over 10 years, four kilograms. That's all they got. And the main outcome was cardiovascular disease. And many of you know the literature and know what happened. Nothing happened. You know, hundred million dollars down the drain, hazard ratio 0.95, p-value 0.51, you don't get any more neutral than that. Unfortunately, I wish I could tell you that you could sit down with your patients and, and you can counsel them on weight loss. And they'll, so occasionally they'll be successful, but it doesn't work for the masses. It isn't, it's a disease that you can't modify very easily with lifestyle. And then the sad history of drugs. And several of these were trials I did. Um, amphetamines are just awful. You know, high abuse potential, hypertension. Fenfluramine, fatal pulmonary hypertension. Fenfen, valvular heart disease, withdrawn. Sibutramine was withdrawn for increased cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. It was a terrible outcome. Uh, Orlistat, I didn't want to talk about anal you know, leak leakage. You know, that's not <laughs> that not very pleasant. Uh, Ramonabot, I did one of the Ramonabot studies and it was withdrawn, got approved in Europe and withdrawn because people were killing themselves. Uh, Lor Lorcaserin actually got approved and was withdrawn because it caused malignancy. And I did the uh, bupropion naltrexone study and that showed no benefit and they didn't lose very much weight. So the question is, We've shown already, now we showed, you know, during the last decade, we showed that bariatric surgery could reduce first diabetes. But can it reduce cardiovascular disease? That is an important question. Not just diabetes, but cardiovascular disease. So I linked up with another of our bariatric surgeons who was a successor to the prior bariatric surgeon. We, we did a study, now it was an observational study, and I will tell you, I don't do very many observations. <laughs> you know, I'm an RCT guy, but there, we couldn't do a large RCT with very Just We tried, we tried to get the NIH to fund it, they wouldn't do it. And so we did this study and it was the most carefully matched study we could do. We took people referred for bariatric surgery and those in whom we got the insurance company to cover it, got bariatric surgery, but a bunch of them were very, very nicely matched, inverse probability weighting and Cox proportional hazards modeling. So we had as closely matched a group of people as you can imagine who did get bariatric surgery matched with those that did. And we published this in JAMA, Aliyah Minion and I, uh, several years ago, I think it was 2019. And here's what happened. We got uh, a pretty robust weight loss, you know, it was, you know, around 20%. And we got, a, as you would expect, a very nice reduction in hemoglobin A1C. Okay, that's not a surprise. But here's what happened. We defined as a primary endpoint, six component phase, I'm not sure all the components. And look, I do a lot of clinical trials. When you see a hazard ratio of 0.61, even if our observational study was wrong by large margin, 
that's a 39% reduction in morbidity and mortality. If you look at just three component links, yeah, stroke, MI, it's a 38% reduction. Look at how quickly, you notice that there's an early hazard, but then rapidly the Kaplan IR occurs separate. Let me show you more about this study that we did. All cause mortality, 41% reduction, enormous. Heart failure, biggest difference. It was, uh, it was a 62% reduction in the risk of heart failure. Just incredible. Coronary disease, 31% reduction. Stroke, cerebrovascular disease, 33% reduction. Nephropathy. This includes end stage renal disease, all kinds of you know, bad renal outcomes, 60% reduction. And atrial fibrillation, a 22% reduction. Oops. However, I will be the first to tell you. We did this in part because we wanted to, to see whether the morbidity, the cardiovascular or related morbidities due to obesity could be reversed. But in the years after metabolic surgery, some people end up on TPN, half of them had endoscopy, interventional radiology procedures, repeat abdominal surgical procedures, abdominal wall hernia, and cholecystectomies, they had a lot of downstream adverse effects. It's not something to be considered lightly, but for somebody that's a really high risk, BMI is approaching 40. And you know, this is something I think, yeah, I don't know if you have a big bariatric surgical program here or not, but it is something that cardiologists, I send patients that I see to our bariatric surgeon because I believe that we can reduce their morbidity substantially if they're willing to accept that there are some consequences. Now, we also did something. At the time they had bariatric surgery, surgery our surgeons under direct vision from the, from the endoscopic procedure, uh, they did a direct liver biopsy. So we have liver biopsy in everybody that had bariatric surgery because as I think, I hope you know, uh, it is a really big problem, fatty liver disease. And this is what it looks like. Uh, that's what a fatty liver looks like. And it progresses to non-alcoholic status. You can see the cellular infiltrated panel B, then cirrhosis, and then either transplant or death. And this problem is really increasing at an alarming rate. It used to be that hepatitis C was the, re was the leading cause for liver transplantation. But it's now between alcoholic liver disease and NASH cirrhosis, they're competing for the leading cause of liver failure and transplantation. And this disease is everywhere. And by the way, if you see an obese patient and they have elevated liver enzymes, watch out. You know, I, am not, I have a whole lecture about how to manage those patients. But here's what we did. We looked at, again, very carefully matched controls with their surgical patients. Now, I've never seen a hazard ratio of 0.12. You can see what happens is that progression to major liver, adverse liver outcomes, cirrhosis, transplantation, or liver-related death goes up over the next decade, and a metabolic surgery patients virtually have none of it. Hazard ratio 0.12 is an 88% reduction in the risk of these adverse liver outcomes. So, fatty liver disease in patients with obesity can be reversed. So, then the question is can newer pharmacological therapies achieve uh, the weight loss offered by a bariatric surgeon? And as you might know, there's now, it's now the, the drug of the, of the decade is semaglutide can produce dose-dependent reductions in body weight. You, you need to give a lot. The 2.4 milligram dose is required, but you can see here about a 10% weight loss in this you know, very typical study of semaglutide uh, in uh, weight. GLP-1 agonists do in fact achieve substantial weight loss. 
Not as much as bariatric surgery yet, but it's coming. And it's also important to understand that there are three ingredients. And cardiologists should understand the ingredients. GLP-1, GIP, and glucagon receptors. And you can design multifunctional peptides that can be agonists, or in some cases antagonists, for any of those three ingredients. And you can do it in a single molecule. And basically what you do is you create a hybrid. And so the question is, what about dual or triple uh, uh, agonists? And what you have to understand is that these increasing receptors are not just in the pancreas, but they're in the heart, they're in adipose tissue, liver, intestines, and even the brain. And it turns out the brain is the target because when you give GLP-1 agonists, you're turning off this drive to overeat. And that's because the receptors are everywhere. Now, here's how it works. Uh, here are the peptides, and you can create a balanced hybrid where you, you're an agonist for all three ingredients or an unbal imbalanced hybrid. And we've been in very interested in this for a long time, and as you're going to show you, we're studying. So terzepatide is the first of the dual agonists, and it was recently approved for obesity. It's been approved for a couple of years now for diabetes. It's a multifunctional peptide. It is more active at GIP than GLP. Think of it as a dual agonist that's GIP stronger than GLP. Half-life of five days, which means you can give it, uh, you can give it once a week, just like semaglutide. And by the way, I prescribe these drugs, and you should be comfortable. Cardiologists should be comfortable with prescribing these kinds of drugs for our patients. This is our disease. Don't send them to endocrinology. Take care of them. Learn to use these drugs. It's, like, it's easy. It's very, very easy, and you ought to be able to do it. Well, this is what happened. When trisepidine was studied over 72 weeks, the mean weight loss was 22, median weight loss was 22.5%. That's in the same range as urine and white gastric bypass. So it's twice the weight loss seen with semaglutide. And that's at the top dose of 15 milligrams, which by the way, is actually better tolerated than semaglutide. And so what about triple agonists? What if you, what if you agonize all three receptors? And for those of you who read the New England Journal, you know that Retatratide has now been studied. It's heading toward approval. It's going to be on the market for the next year or two. It's, again, it's a GIP, <coughs> GLP, and glucagon agonist. It's most potent at GIP. It's six-day half-life. And it was studied in a 48-week, almost a year, phase two trial. So this is just 48 weeks. And the median weight loss was 24.2% at the top dose, and it's still going down. It is just uh, incredibly effective. Uh, it's not available yet, but it's going to be available very soon. We are on the verge of a turning point in the ability to treat this epidemic. Unfortunately, these drugs are expensive. That's the biggest downside, but they work. In female patients, there seems to be, for all of these drugs, a bigger effect. 28.5% median weight loss. In you know, somebody who's, who's, you know, 250 pounds, you know, they, they end up being close to normal body weight when you, when you give them a drug like Rejectrotide. Well, can we, can we come up with an oral drug that does this? And so, but yeah, if you read it in the journal, Last year, or for Glipron, it's a non-peptide GLP-1 agonist, and it's being developed. It was studied. It's a partial agonist for GLP-1 receptors. It's got a half-life sufficient to be given once a day, so it's 29 to 49 hours given orally, and was studied only a 36-week trial. 
But here's an oral drug. People with a mean BMI of 37.9 got a 14.7% weight loss, and it's still going down with this drug. One, once a day pill that does what these injectable agents do, and it's coming. It's going to be approved within a couple of years. Well, can these drugs do what we saw in our observational study with bariatric surgery? Important question answered by a study. It was not a study that we did at C5 Research, our, our clinical trial center, but the PI was my colleague, Mike Lindhoff. Uh, no one artist does not do academic trials. They come into my trials. And it was called SELECT. Uh, many of you saw it. Semaglutide, given over a period of about 48 months, 20% reduction in CV death, non-fatal stroke, or myocardial infarction. Uh, landmark study, basically showing that you can do this with a, for the first time in history, with a pharmacological issue. Not one that's going to be withdrawn for adverse effects, but one that actually is quite safe. And although they didn't handle this well in the trial design, because there's no p-value, because it wasn't properly uh, linked in the hierarchical testicle procedure, but here is the the uh, all-cause mortality effect. Uh, hazard ratio of 0.81 <clears throat> with an upper confidence interval of 0.9. So all-cause mortality was decreased in obese patients who didn't have diabetes with some of the So really, really incredible. Well, what about your Zepatide? You got a more powerful agent. So what can we do in these patients that are not diabetic? Uh, and we're doing this trial, on the study chair for the trial, we're studying Select was only secondary prevention. There's people that already had, a, had it in that. We're studying both primary and secondary prevention in the trisepatide study. And here are our endpoints. It's called surmount MMO, and it's all cause mortality, non fatal MI, non fatal stroke, coronary revascularization, and heart failure events. We're going to look at all these endpoints in a composite, and we're going to look at them individually as well. We didn't do just a narrow endpoint. We took all the things that we think are going to be impacted, and we put them in to the primary endpoint. Now, Brown and Goldstein, who were very smart, I know many of you have met them, I, 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 Michael Brown's quite a character if you hear about this guy. In 1996, they got the Nobel Prize for studying the LDL receptor. And they wrote an article in Science, prestigious journal, saying heart attacks are going to be gone at the turn of the century. Well, you know, they thought if you could just control LDL cholesterol, heart attacks would go away. I don't think they understood the power of the contemporary uh, Western diet. Uh, that they didn't understand the obesity epidemic that was already coming at this point in time. So I searched the world to find the world's most pathogenic food. And I found it in Scotland. For those of you who've been there in Scotland, you can fry everything. And I want to show you, you know, what Brown and Goldstein didn't anticipate. This is a deep fried Mars bar. <laughs> you take, uh, it's the world's most pathogenic food. It's deep, deep, deep. You take the Mars bar, you batter it, and then you deep flat fry it. It comes out as a nice warm kind of gooey mass. You eat it. It goes straight to the left main coronary artery, <laughs> and then you die. <laughs> well, in age of Scotland, we got our own, okay? Now their sign says billions and billions serve, okay? Driving our obesity epidemic. Let me just show you how bad it is. This is the, uh, the Big Mac fries and Coke. It's 1,360 calories, about what I eat in a day, okay? And it has 57 grams of fat. It has 84 grams of sugar, which is 168% of the recommended daily allowance. It is an incredible, an absolutely incredibly atherogenic meal, and it's being consumed every single day. 
So let me sum summarize. Obesity increases rates of coronary disease, heart failure, stroke, atrial fibrillation, and all cause mortality. It is abdominal obesity, waist circumference that is more closely linked to adverse outcomes in BMI, even in physically fed and metabolically healthy obese patients. The mechanism of harm includes glucose intolerance, hypertension, inflammation is measured by CRP or IL-6, increased triglycerides, and low HDL. Substantial weight loss with bariatric surgery has been linked to reduced cardiovascular risk and is now potentially achievable with pharmacological therapies. My message to you is learn to treat this disease. It's a cardiovascular disease. We have medications now that we can administer. We should manage these patients. You should manage these patients. Keep a tape measure in. Find these patients. Get them on a trajectory that's going to protect them from the consequences, which are going to be found in the cath lab and in the CCD. And we need to own this. Thank you very much for your time. A little time for questions. Nick, uh, that was a uh, I enjoyed the most in years, I think. Really Thank you very much. Um, I'm a heart failure doctor. I treat uh, ejection fraction flow, goes up, patients ask me, can I stop the medication? And I would say, no, you can't. And so this question, of course, is discussed uh, with uh, Ms. Wagos drugs. What's your take on that? Yeah. Uh, so here's my, my thing, first of all. I agree with what you said, okay? <laughs> if you have somebody that has uh, hypercholesterolemia and you put them on a staff and their LDL goes down, do you take away the staff? No. Uh, if you have a hypertension and you lower the blood pressure, it goes down. You take away the hypertension, and you say the same. You're saying the same thing. So it is. It is lifelong treatment. I think we may be entering an era when we will have reduction therapy and maintenance therapy. You might induce with a drug like terzepatide or rutatrutide, and then maybe switch to or 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 lipron, you know, oral drug. And sooner or later, by the way, you know, within the careers of our particularly our younger people. These drugs are going to be generic. They're not going to cost what they cost now. And insurers are beginning, now that we have evidence that in non-diabetic obese patients, we can reduce morbidity and mortality, we're going to get these drugs paid for. But I do think that there, we need to study the possibility of induction therapy and then maintenance therapy as a potential way to Other questions? So thank you for that great talk. Um, as you all know, in, in the U.S. and beyond, the unhelpful dietary pattern is the norm. Not yeah. Yes, it is. And so we're facing, it's a societal level issue. We're obviously facing multiple headwinds. Yes. Uh, for example, the farm bill subsidizing animal aggregates oh. of billions of dollars. Um, well, we're trying to nibble at the edges. But, can you give us hope or your thoughts on how we may bend the curve on a societal level to help make these a more helpful diet, a bit more of the norm? Yeah, I, I think we have to get into the schools because this starts in childhood. You know, um, every now and then when I'm traveling, you know, I will stop to get a diet coke at McDonald's. And if you ever go in those places, I hope most of you don't, uh, look around, okay? And what you see is a teenager there with a bulging belly uh, that clearly is on a trajectory towards a reduced lifespan and horrible morbidity, you know, diabetes and cardiovascular disease and so on. I think get into schools, we teach about nutrition. Uh, we try to do some things to encourage physical fitness. You know, a lot of schools have eliminated physical education. That's one of the big trends now is they don't have PE. When I was a kid, we all went out to PE. So I think there are things that we can do. Uh, I wish it were simple, but it's not simple. But I think we got to get to people earlier in life. That would be the most important thing to do. And it may not work. You know, here's what's going on. We evolved as a species. Uh, having food shortages. You know, our ancient ancestors in Africa, you know, they ate off the land, 
food was not plentiful, and they learned that our bodies adapted to store fat. Because you could store some fat, you could get through those periods where you didn't have access to food. And so we are programmed to store fat. Now food is plentiful and it's high in calories and we're programmed. And you know, we've seen this in the Pima Indians and there are other places where they, they just you give them almost any excess in calories and they store it as fat. So it is a problem biologically for our species. Yes. Hi. I'm Jerry Lecture very much. Uh, you talked a little bit about this, but uh, for a, a topic fat, we can image this topic fat. Yes, for for example, with, with CT, we have yes. done some work yes. on the yes. And exactly. these drugs can modulate that fat. That's well. right. Do you think that we can use uh, that or, or guide with imaging the, the treatment of, of those patients that are not, uh, not only in, in physical like, uh, parameters of obesity? Just use to guide yeah. the, the treatment. Well, I do think there's some potential there. Uh, and certainly for identification of people that are at greater risk. And you know, you're quite right. You can you can image the, this uh, now with, with contemporary imaging techniques. I think it's something to be explored. It's got to be studied, probably should be studied in a randomized controlled way. But if you can do that, I think you may be able to show that there's a potential benefit. So I'm open to that idea. And you have the mission again, uh, great talk. Um, one of the major problems we have in medicine in general is yeah. compliance and communication. Oh. Oh. So, I mean, be, if I look at what's the compliance of uh, anticoagulation in patients with child vascular 4, you always see you know, people that are non compliant, yeah. despite the fact that they know they might have a stroke. Yeah. So, with this, one of the reasons why I like the bariatric surgery is because the therapy. You know, it's the best compliance, but yeah. you show us possible, you know, side effect that comes. So, do you have data about, you know, the non-compliance to medication and the long-term side effect of this medication? So here, what, here's what we know. Okay, people love these drugs because they see the results. See, the problem with anticoagulation is you don't see anything, you don't feel any different. Okay, here, people become more active. They are happier. Uh, there's an increased improvement in mood, and they see their the weight coming off. People who are obese are depressed. They have uh, bad self-image. Uh, there are all kinds of psychological effects, and those go away when they lose weight. Um, I'll tell you just an anecdote. There's somebody I, I, I'm working with on the Trisepatite study. He's one of the key people at Eli Lilly that I work with. When she was very obese, morbidly obese. And when the trial started, she was a pain in the ass. I mean, <laughs> just, you know, I mean, I work, I can work with anybody, but she was terrible. And then she got trisepatite. And she got it for free. And she worked for you, I will. And she, she started it. And she lost maybe 100 pounds. And She's now one of the most pleasant people. <laughs> and honestly, her whole personality changed. And so the reason compliance is high here is people like the way they feel when they lose all this weight. And so it's not a problem. And that little that little pen you put up your skin once a week is pretty easy. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a little bit the uh, BMI of 25, which which um, uh, as a yeah. uh, person was almost equivalent to somebody with a 30 BMI, right. right? Which is a concussion, maybe. Yeah. Like that. yeah. So that really can show us that uh, that the generic ancestry may play a role. Yes. And, and, and when, uh, when you talk about putting the genetic scores or risks to uh, to target our treatment with this medication. Well, it's an interesting idea. It hasn't been well studied. You know, I, as you know, in cardiovascular disease, and we're working in this area as well, polygenic risk scores are really interesting. But we haven't done that here, and we probably should. Uh, I still think that the phenotype is helpful. That waist to hip ratio turns out to be really powerful. And it's so easy to measure, you know. And I, I assume most of you have seen people 
in South Asia, the ancestry with that little gummy bulge and a really low HDL. And, you know, you know what's coming. And if we can somehow intervene, we can make a difference in the future. Yes. Thanks so much for the incredible lecture. Uh, I was uh, curious about, you know, you point out very quickly how you see clearly uh, related to evidence of your risk. Uh, but how much does diet impact that in terms of, let's say you have somebody who eats steak and hamburgers every single day, but they don't have a caloric access, right? Yeah. They are maybe 1,400 calories a day. And uh, as a result of the amount of uh, somebody who eats a vegan diet, you know, only lives with clean and healthy food, but they eat 3,000 calories a day. Um, how do you balance it? So um, we have a little data here. I I'm going to tell you that I have a relatively negative view of the impact of diet here. Um, I know it's very popular now to have these, you know, vegan, you know, plant-based diets and so on, and you do lower LDL, you know, ten percent or so when you shift from the bad diet to the good diet. But you know, we can do five milligrams of a suicide and lower LDL by forty percent. So. The best data is from the Predimet study, and the Predimet study is a little bit, a little bit dirty. As you know, they had to do a, a retraction correction on that study because of the way they handled the, the study. But it did show in primary prevention that the Mediterranean diet was associated with lower risk. What I tell people is that the healthiest diet that we have evidence for is Mediterranean diet. We have an RCP. We don't have an RCP for this, this trend now in plant-based diets. It's not an RCP. And so I think somebody's got to do an RCP and find out. And maybe it's great, maybe it's not, but I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical because what basically diet does is it has an effect. If you eat a lot of salt, your blood pressure goes up. And if you eat a lot of fat, your LDL goes up a little bit. But now so I just wanted to comment. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody, they're all laughing. Well, you know, I had like a plant-based diet. But, and uh, you're absolutely right. There's way more evidence for the Mediterranean style yeah. diet, which in truth is largely yeah. a plant-based diet. Yeah. And nobody thinks plant-based diet is going to make you bulletproof. They're just yeah. one piece of a larger puzzle yeah. diet to help improve health. Yeah. And compared to Mediterranean style diet, this is still quite speculative. But there are a couple of smaller randomized trials, 100. Uh, people, different people in different outcomes, where there are the surrogate endpoints like LDL, et cetera, fall more on a plant based, healthy plant based versus the Mediterranean, liver fat falls more on the green Mediterranean diet. But these are small yeah. randomized trials. So 0.7% of the US consumes a healthy dietary pattern, <laughs> non lentil article. Yeah. So people, that, you know, for better than I can argue which is the super most greatest diet. But we're so many miles away from that that every step in that direction is important. And one randomized trial by Dr. Jenkins showed that uh, a, a high fiber plant based diet can lower LDL and cholesterol about the same as 20 milligrams of uh, metal. So, Steve, uh, yeah. I'm going to a wedding on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my cousin, she's uh, has a BMI of 24. Yeah. But she wanted to. Uh, go to her daughter's wedding. Yeah. On a dress that she wore 20 years ago when her BMI was close to 18. Yeah. So she got herself in a sample. No, that's bad. Um, I, I'll take you up to here to a tour of our emergency room so you can find how many patients have a BMI of 24 and they're probably zero. <laughs> um, I'm sure that everybody here has tried to prescribe Osempic or Munjaro on our patients, and it's very, very, very difficult to get that. So we are here in the Bronx, by the way, the highest BMI county in the New York area. Is that right? The lowest socioeconomic income. Yes. So there is yeah. a completely a inverse relationship. And you're right. You go around and you'll find McDonald's and things like that, whereas the vegan restaurants are in Manhattan and you know, yeah. it's uh, you know more, more, more difficult to afford. So uh, I think you know, don't you think that this is a matter that definitely should be a priority for the government to correct? It should be. Look, 
if you add up the cost, I didn't put the slides in, but I have slides here on the cost of obesity in hundreds of billions of dollars. Okay. We could treat a lot of people with obesity. If we had $10 billion, let's say, invested in treating this disorder, you could treat a lot of people, even at the current pricing of the drugs. And I think the government should be allowed to negotiate pricing with, with the pharmaceutical industry, which is, as you know, is something that's very hard to accomplish. So we can get the prices down to something that could be afforded. And I think that would be a great investment by the government. Now, unfortunately in Hollywood, uh, semaglutide is very popular. You know, actors and actresses that want to look good in movies and television are getting this drug, these drugs. And poor people who are morbidly obese can't get them. And it's a problem and we have to deal with it. It's a political problem and it means we got to engage in the political. And I am engaged in the political sphere, as you probably know. And one last question. Do we get to that point of you're successful politically? Yeah. yeah. Made that change? Um, so we try reforming, but that's the thing of the past. It doesn't really do very much. I will tell you what I would do, and I, I'm, I'm hesitant to say this because what I'm going to say, FDA says no to. Okay. There are two approaches that you can use. There are very ethical Canadian pharmacies where you can get semaglutide uh, orally, oral semaglutide, which is a drug you know as Robelsis for about one third the cost in the United States. And it's the same drug in the same packaging from the same company, no one hurts. You can get it for your patients. And then there are compounding form, form, formulations where you, they actually can get some glutide, they can compound it. I don't know if you guys know about this. And then they deliver it in a vial to patients, a little syringe with a small needle, and they can self-inject. And it's about one fifth of the cost of some of the type uh, prescribed uh, appropriately. Now, FDA is, is against this. And so I'm, you know, obviously saying something I shouldn't be saying, but patients come first. Um, I'm going to have to stop here. You guys are going to be meeting with Dr. Mason in the fellow soon, so you can continue with some of these questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. I came here. I didn't realize that you were in the capital. So, so, so it turns out the relevance of the, of the talk is it's very nice. No, that was exceptional. I hope I hope that the folks here are looking at Oh, we are. Well, I don't know. At the end of the day, if you do a post the prevention of all the downstream consequences of obesity are more positive than wrong. So that's why the government has to So, so, yeah, yeah. I want to look up seven blue type
which you know, is you, very possible. You, you, it's usually it's seven, the weight goes back up. Weight goes back up. It yeah. takes a while. Yeah. Now, I have had people go on front yeah. and, yeah. and stay more slender. I very disciplined. I don't know. And um, they will be maybe part of the weight pass, but not all. Uh, and that's why I think there may be a, a strategy here for a maintenance. Uh, you know, what can be the pregnancy? Can we take it to the pregnancy? Or it's very, very short. But there is something. Preeclampsia, of course, is a strong link to Oh, no. Oh. This is a McDonald's movie that was made here in New York about 20 years ago. There was a guy who, for six weeks, only ate McDonald's, nothing else. And his, his liver ends up. I used to like Big Mac. I have, from the day I saw the movie, I'm not very Big Mac. I've never eaten. Super science is a new cardiologist made that movie. You need to see the liver biopsies and you get very, very active. If you see the liver, you see the nodules of the nodules of the nodules. Let's do a big dose of oxygen. Yeah, you can take it out. Yeah. 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 Yeah